Welcome to the Memorial Day ceremony here in Waxhaw. My name is Joyce White. I used to be a town commissioner, and uh, I really, I did several of the uh, Memorial Days and Veteran Days too. And you know, I never cease to be honored. This is an honor to stand here and, and do these ceremonies. Can you hear me? All right. Y'all can't hear me. Let me know because you know if I'm gonna talk, I like to be heard. <laughs> and uh, so it's always an honor to be here. You know, one day I was in Walmart, and uh, there was a man checking out. He was in a wheelchair, and as I walked past him, I noticed it's like the cap just sort of jumped out at me. It said "Veteran Career and War," and as I walked past, I gently reached out and touched his arm and I said, uh, thank you for your service, sir. And without missing a beat, he turned at me and had just a little smile on his face and said, thank you for caring. Now, you know, I did that to be a blessing to him. <laughs> but it turned out that I, I was the one, I was the one that was blessed. And uh, that it's, it's always, I always try to a service person, I appreciate their service. Uh, you know, Memorial Day is the most solemn of all American holidays. It is the day that we honor all of the American soldiers ever lost in the service of our country. And throughout American history, there have been more than, get this, 1.3 million men and women that have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. You know, we can start with the Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. And in that war, there were 25,000 deaths. And the War of 1812, that started in 1812 and lasted till 1815, there were 20,000 deaths. And then we have the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848 and there were 13,283 lives lost in that war and then we move up to the Civil War 1861 to 1865 and there was uh, 623,026 deaths Spanish-American War 19, 1898 to 1898, <laughs> didn't last very long, 2,446 deaths. The Philippine War, 1898 to 1902, 4,196 deaths. And then you have World War I, 1917 to 1918, 116,708 deaths. And then there was World War II, 1941 to 1945, uh, 407,316 deaths. And the Korean War, 1950 to 1953, 36,914 deaths. The Vietnam War, of course, we know that was from 64 to 73, 58,169 deaths. And Beirut, 1982 to 1984, 266 deaths. And then we have the Persian Gulf War, Gulf War 1991, with uh, 269 deaths. And then you have Afghanistan, 2002 to the present, 2,345 deaths, and we're still counting. Iraq, 2003 to present, 4,486 deaths and counting. We owe our eternal debt to our American, American veterans who chose to set aside their personal ambitions and dreams to assure the well-being of our nation. You know, I read somewhere that 97% of us Americans wake up and enjoy freedom every day, but only 3%, only 3% will defend it. At this time, we would like to extend a special welcome to some of the distinguished members of our audience. Uh, 
if you would stand and be recognized. I know we have some of our town commissioners here. Would you all stand and let me see who you are? I know Paul Fitzgerald and uh, Fred Barrow, Brenda Stewart. Is that it? Let's, let's give them a hand. We also have Richard Helms, uh, County Commissioner. Where's Richard? Let's give him a hand. And uh, Mark Brody, State Representative. Where's Mark? Let's give Mark a hand. Thank you. Now, have, have I missed anybody? Who? Mayor. Where is the mayor? Somebody said, there he is. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. Let's give him a big hand. Where's Jim? Jim Warner. I missed him. All right, here. Craig Horn. They said Craig Horn's here. Where's Craig? I'm over here. We're so glad you're here. We're well represented today by dignitaries. And also, did I get everybody? Huh? Speak now. <laughs> Also, the commander of um, American Legion Post 208, Commander Wallace Higgins. First. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we really appreciate it. And we welcome and thank all of our audience members who serve, have served, or have faithfully supported those who have served in the armed forces. Uh, Will those who have served in the U.S. Army, will you please stand? But let me say one thing. If you're sitting, I mean, if you're already standing, raise your hand because I don't want to miss anybody. So if you are with the U.S. Army or served in the U.S. Army, please raise, please stand or raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for your service. All right, how about Marines? Same thing. Stand or raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And how about the U.S. Navy? How about standing up? All right. Thank you. Thank you for your service. I'm a little partial to U.S. Navy. My late husband was in the U.S. Navy. All right, Air Force. Let's, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. How about Coast Guard? Do we have Coast Guard members here? Please stand. We thank you for your service. And we thank the spouses that, that were with you during your time of service, too. Thank you. you know, I miss that. I, all my friends... They talk about what it was like when their husbands was in the service, and Jeff and I didn't get together until he was out of service. And I was a little bit jealous, because I missed all that. You know, I would like to have been a part of that, and I think it's awesome, because you serve in your own way, too. Um, today's ceremony is dedicated to all lifestyle veterans that have or are serving or have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Um, Please rise for the, uh, y'all give me a minute. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, please rise for the presentation and uh, changing of our colors by the Parkwood Junior ROTC. Our flag is a symbol of our country. Have you ever stopped to think what the flag really means? The blue in our flag stands for the valor with which our ancestors fought and died in the many battles that have been fought for our country and all that which it stands. The white stands for the purity in all of our hearts. It represents the honor that each of us should show in our everyday lives. The red 
The red stands for all the men and women who have died in the service of our country, both members of the armed forces as well as everyday citizens. Our flag has been carried into every battle into which there has been United States citizens, from the American Revolution to the Civil War to World War I and World War II and the career in conflict, from Vietnam to Desert Storm and the fight for freedom in the Middle East. It has flown over some battles that were never declared, such as Beirut, Beirut uh, where the Marine barracks were blown up by terrorists. In New York City, it flew over ruins from a cowardly attack that we know today is 9-11. In all of these, we, the American people, have stayed true to the values <coughs> the flag represents. We should always value the sacrifices that have been made for our flag and the country it represents. There are some general rules uh, from our national flag code that we should all observe to honor the American flag. The flag should be lighted at all times, either by sunlight or by the appropriate light source. The flag should be flown in fair weather only unless the flag is designated for inclement weather use. The flag should never be dipped to any person or thing. It is flown upside down only, only in a distress signal. The flag should not be used for any decoration in general. The flag should never be used as an, advertise, as an advertising purpose. It should not be embroidered, printed, or otherwise impressed on such articles as cushions, handkerchiefs, napkins, boxes, or anything intended to be discarded after temporary use. Advertising signs should not be attached to the staff. The flag should not be used as any part of a costume <laughs> or athletic uniform, except that a flag patch may be used on the uniform of military personnel, firemen, policemen, and members of patriotic organizations. The flag should never have any mark, insignia, letter, word, number, figure, or drawing of any kind placed on it or attached to it. The flag should never be used for receiving, uh, holding, carrying, or delivering anything. When the flag is lowered, no part of it should touch the ground or any object. It should be received by waiting hands and arms. To store the flag, it should be folded neatly and ceremoniously. The flag should be cleaned and mended when necessary. When a flag is so worn, it is no, no longer fit to serve as a symbol of our country. It should be destroyed by burning in a dignified manner. Old oh, glory, old oh, glory, the red, white, and blue, star-spangled banner, all names fitting you. Fifty states standing, fifty stars standing for each state on a field of blue for justice sake. First colonies, the 13 stripes, red shows bravery and honesty is white. Our flag waving across the nation's sky fills us with patriotic pride, a symbol of our love so true.
now please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by Miss Rachel Sawhook. Veterans, please render a salute, and citizens, please place your hands over your hearts when you hear the Star Spangled Banner begin. Oh, see, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rain we watch we're so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bones bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. remain standing for the recitation of our Pledge of Allegiance by Cub Scouts, Pack Too cute. Um, please be seated. Pastor Chris Whitaker will deliver the in invocation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace this day. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your compassion upon this nation. Lord, on this Memorial Day in which we remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, we pause to reflect upon such a high cost. Allow us to see just how blessed we really are as a nation. May we understand and be more grateful in knowing why we have the freedoms 
that we enjoy today. Lord, we take this time to pray for the families who's lost the loved ones. Reveal to them that You're near the brokenhearted. May they be reassured of Your presence. Comfort them through Your Holy Spirit, allowing them the peace which surpasses all understanding. As we remember those who have given their lives, we ask for Your protection of those who continue to put their lives on the line today. May their efforts bring the peace which needs to be established in our world. Stir our hearts. Stir our leaders' hearts. Stir, stir the world leaders' hearts in remembering the devastating toll taken from war. Give us all a true passion for peace by changing our hearts and our minds. We know ultimate peace will not come into this world, but only when your kingdom comes will it be in full. We ask for growth of peace throughout the world so that fewer and fewer men and women would be spared and not have to sacrifice their lives. Thank you for your Son who made the ultimate sacrifice for all nations and all men. Thank you for the eternal peace which everyone can have through understanding His sacrifice. Lord, we ask your continued hand upon this nation and always allow us to remember the price paid for this precious freedom we have as we honor those here and their families who have fallen today. For it's in Jesus' holy and precious and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Chris. And thank the little Cub Scouts, too. That was, that was really beautiful. At this time, uh, could American Legion Commander Wally Higgins please come to the podium for the flag presentation? Mr. Rudy? Yeah, that's it. On behalf of a grateful American Legion, the town of Waxhaw, and the citizens of the Waxhaw community, we'd like to present to you this flag that has flown over the town of Waxhaw this year. Honored to serve with these guys at the American Legion Post 208 here in Waxhaw. If you're a veteran and serve, they would love to have you as part of the group. It's a great group of guys and it's a great fellowship. I encourage you to join. Well, Bill, don't go too far. He's our speaker today. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Bill Rooley. And I want to talk about him just a minute. Bill was uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina when he enlisted in the Navy in January 1958. After boot camp, he was assigned to the Navy Weapons Depot and Naval Gun Factory in Washington, D.C. Then he was assigned to Norfolk, then to Little Creek, his sea duty included assignments on tank landing ships and dock landing ships, supporting amphibious operations, carrying tanks, vehicles, cargoes, hovercrafts, and uh, helicopters. He arrived on the construction battalion amphibious force U.S. LST 1154, Tallahatchie, U.S. Donner, LSD 20, U.S. York County, LST 1175, USS San Marcos, LSD 25, and USS Grant County, LST 1174. In 1963, Bill's rank was boat's mate, seaman. His uh, time in service covered the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, Bay of Pigs, and the Vietnam Era. One of the highlights 
of this service was Operation MNCs. Bill and his crew sailed the North Atlantic and entered by way of Canada into the Great Lakes through the St. Lawrence Seaway. This passage gave them the rank of freshwater man of war's man. Being in the Navy and being part of the CB amphibious force, they carried two sea bags. One is a sailor <laughs> and one is a marine. Bill has been awarded a Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Overseas Commemorative, U.S. Navy Commemorative, Special Operations Commemorative. Bill made special note that all service personnel received the Cold War Certificate from the Secretary of Defense. Uh, Bill said he joined the Navy 59 years ago. Bill has also been married to his lovely wife since 1958, 59 years. Let me repeat that, 59 years. Where is they? They, woo Let's give them a, a hand. <laughs> Anybody that's been married 59 years, the same person ought to be recognized. <laughs> But anyway, they have two adult sons, two wonderful daughters-in-law, and six wonderful grandchildren that I bet they don't spoil at all. He formed the William H. Ruley and Associates Real Estate and Counseling. Y'all join me in giving a hearty welcome to Bill Ruley as he like to thank everybody for coming when I was asked to do this I thought about all the speakers we've had over the years here we've had a lot of heroes we've had a lot of generals admirals and I thought you know I don't know if I'm qualified for this or not but one thing I've been able to come to grips with in life was and recently uh, past few years is that uh, I didn't want to say no to anything anymore so today I'm going to talk about basically about my experience as a young man and where I am today and uh, uh, thank uh, my wonderful wife which has already been missed, mentioned uh, it, it's most of us guys, it used to be a thing, I think they still say it, that behind every man there's a successful woman. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, you know, I like to tell you we had a fairy tale marriage, but uh, we had our ups and downs, but I'm thankful that the Lord saw, saw us through it all. I uh, joined the Navy when I was 17 years old. So in today's society, I probably would have been a failure. I went to basic training, and as the guys that already have been in service understand uh, how it was back in those days. I think, yeah, I think all our instructors wore a size 12 shoe, uh, size E, E probably. The main reason I say that is because when you join the they put you through a very rigorous training. And uh, I didn't quite understand that to begin with, but the, really the reason the training was there was that they wanted to know, these instructors had been through a lot, they wanted to know, could I back up Wally Higgins? Could I be the man that would cover his back when he went into battle? They trained us to fight. We were fighters. We were trained to be that way. And I bet most of these guys can still remember. I can't remember a lot of things sometimes. It takes me a few minutes to recall things. But I can still tell you my service number is 523-6264. And when I first got out of the Navy, I thought that after a couple of weeks, I felt real strange. And I said to myself, something's wrong. And then I realized that for four years, I'd been 
somebody telling me what to do, how to do, and when to do it. And that like we, like most of the guys, we didn't have any choice where we went. We went where we were told and we did what we were told to do. So I basically what I'm saying is I thought that somebody stopped the world and let me off. But, but anyway, I had four years of active duty, two years in active duty. Back then we used to have, uh, we could be called back up at any time if the government needed us to serve. Fortunately, I was never recalled. But anyway, uh, my first year in Washington, D.C. was a dream. I was at the Navy Weapons Depot. I was put on a YTD-5, which was really a tugboat. We assisted the deep sea divers, sailed up and down the Potomac River. And most of you guys appreciate this. That was such a cushy duty. I thought, man, I can do this for 30 years. But after that, they decided to send me to Little Creek, put me in the ACBs, which is amphibious force, and told me that our outfit was 98% casualties, 2% would survive, gave me an M1 rifle I could hardly carry, let alone I kept, got tired of cleaning it because I'm not in that 98%, but we made a lot of, a lot of landings. And I mention this because I think about these guys during training, and they, and they lost their lives. And all of, these, all of these exercises we did, we did a lot of them off the Onslow Beach out here in North Carolina with the Marine Corps. And our job was to build a, a pontoon bridges from the LST to the beach. And the LSDs, they carried the small craft that these guys were picked up in from the cargo ships. Just imagine the seas being 20, 30 feet in waves. Just imagine that you're climbing over a net and you're being picked up by one of these small crafts and how the water jumps back and forth. Just imagine that we ran on, they ran in on the beach, they hit a sandbar and the Marine jumps off and he has a uh, hundred pounds of pack on his back and the water's not, he's not at the beach, it's, it's a of just a sandbar and he drops in the water and it's 20 feet. And we lost a lot of people in training back in those days and I think that this is a time to remember them as well. I'm sure it goes on today. I'm sure the Pentagon knows what those numbers are. I say all that to say that being in the military is not all fun and games. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of training involved in it. And uh, I think about those type of guys. I think they should be remembered as well. I would like to talk to you about my experience with Cuba because Cuba's been in the mail, in the news so much lately. And my son was past Christmas, because he's heard his dad talk about things so much, gave me a Life magazine when cars still sold for $2,500. Dated May 10th, 1963. It's about 20 pages long. And so I asked my lovely granddaughter, who has a writing skills, I said, can you condense this to 10 or 15 minutes for me? And she tried. And I like the kid, kid, because I look out there and I see some Baptists. I'll be out, I'll be through by noon, okay? <laughs> But anyway, uh, I'd, like I said, I'd like to talk about the Bay of Pigs. Uh, we trained for that mission. Uh, you've heard people say that, when I say that I was in the Vietnam era, the time I was in, my brother was in Guatemala uh, and different places. And they were already, back in my time, flying people back from Vietnam in body bags. It didn't become a real war until later. And today we have advisors in 300 to 400 parts of this world. We, we have been the police force, our God's caretaker of this world as best we could. 
and we need to continue that. I know they want to cut budgets, but we need to continue to be uh, the peacemakers if we can. And I think we can. We do have the type of people that live in this country that understand that. So we started training for Cuba two years before we land, before the landing. We sailed up and down the Atlantic coast of Cuba. We loaded up in Moorhead City mainly. We carried tanks, jeeps, trucks, ammunition. And we were going to, Gu going to Guantanamo Bay at night. We would unload those in pitch dark. We'd get up the next morning and everything was gone off the base. And we did this over and over and over, preparing for the Bay of Pigs operation. And the United States uh, trained Cubans in Guatemala for nine months uh, in, a, in an apparent plan, which was apparently planned by uh, people at the Pentagon, White House, CIA. Uh, people, people that are in the ranks, generally we didn't know what we were going to do until we were told what to do. And so the, the orders usually came from, from, from the Pentagon. The goal of the mission was for the airmen to strike most of the Air Force troops in Cuba and send in troops in the remaining in 72 hours so they could establish a free Cuba. We had a fleet of ships down there. Sometimes they refer to just a couple of ships, but we had the whole fleet down there out in the water. Probably when you think it's only 90 miles from the Key West to Cuba, we probably were closer to Cuba with those ships. We had aircraft carriers, destroyers, LSCs, LSDs, submarines. We had the whole fleet. We were prepared, waiting it offshore with air support. The plan was to move in at night and surprise the Cuban army by entering from the west east coast. However, as most of you know, the plan did not go smoothly as hoped. Four days before D-Day in Cuba, April 17, 1961, we disguised U.S. WW-2 planes left out of Nicaragua to make their attack. The plan was to have paratroopers, paratroopers land in strategic locations in Cuba and clear the path for the battalions that would follow. Three of the four battalions, the paratroopers, reached their mark that night, but a fourth did not, leaving the battalion defenseless and ultimately losing Plagar and Lagar, another unexpected barrier. Came when the ships bring in, bringing in the battalion found a reef that was not on the maps that they had studied, causing more trouble sneaking into the beaches. The infantry entered from the sea, had to wrestle with the reefs before them. Within 24 hours, Free Fidel Castro sent out 20,000 troops to fight driving, driving, driving the American forces back. President Kennedy authorized an airstrike, but because of a mix-up in time, the men flying to help take back the skies were shot down. Seeing there was no way to win, many of the men were taken captive and held for months while the U.S. Negotiated to, negotiated to have them freed. Also, many lost their lives because of the U.S. Mis miscalculation. We can see that a couple factors played into the unsuccessful attempt to take back Cuba. The air support was sat, as said to be close by, was unable to show up on time and while the ships held enough supplies to restock those on land, the message wasn't received. And within 24 hours, the troops ran out of ammunition. President John F. Kennedy accepted responsibility for the failed mission and the United States continued to, continued to ponder the problem in Cuba. My reason for telling this part of the story is so that we always remember that those that lost their lives in service to our country as Americans 
we strive to help others and be a beacon for the hope of countries struggling to be free. We owe our freedom then and now to brave men and women that sacrifice themselves so that they can enjoy our lives. Each Memorial Day, we remember those that have passed and have a solemn thank you for all that they did for America. And I always look at myself and think back at my age, and I'm sure a lot of the veterans here think the same, same way. I thank the Lord that I never had to be in a battle. I thank the Lord that I never had to shoot somebody. I can't imagine living with the thoughts that you went into a battle and some, some of these guys that live with these terrible memories uh, deserve all the help and comfort that we can provide for them. And I would like to end by saying to you that I didn't accomplish what I accomplished in life. I've been really blessed. I accomplished this because of my love for the Lord Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And I can thank God for where I am today because He didn't give up on me. I can't tell you that I walked straight down the middle of that path road on my life's journey. I had a lot of regrets. Uh, but I know I'm forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you don't, never make, you know, we make decisions every day. I look out there and all of you made the decision to come today. You made the decision to get up, eat breakfast, come to the memorial service. And we all need to make that decision of where we're going to spend eternity. We have two choices. And uh, so I encourage you, if you aren't a believer, that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I have some of these extra. If you would like one, if you're a believer and like to pass one on to somebody I have for you, I'd like to give them out to you. And God bless America. And I need to set one thing straight. It's usually the Methodists that like to get out at 12. Baptists will go a little bit longer. But anyway, thank you. That was that was pretty awesome. You know, the three-round volley salute is a ceremonial act performed at military funerals. The custom originates from the European domestic wars while the, while the fighting cease so the dead and wounded could be removed. Did you hear that? The fighting ceased so the dead and wounded could be removed. Then, three shots were fired into the air to signal that the battle could resume. Today, the three-round volley is used as a mark of respect for our fallen comrades, and we proudly observe this tradition here today. Today's three-round volley salute is an honor to all the Waxhaw veterans that have passed away this past year. Please turn your attention to the overhead bridge. Ready. Hobby Day is celebrated in countries around the world. This year, the American Legion has brought National Poppy Day to the United States by asking Congress to designate Friday before Memorial Day as National Poppy Day. After World War I, the red poppy became a symbol of the sacrifices 
made by our allied troops, our service members around the world. The poppy fields in Europe flourished after World War I, and scientists, get this, scientists attributed the sudden growth to wild red poppies, of the wild red poppies, to the soils enriched with lime from the newly dug graves and rubble left by the war. The red poppy came to symbolize the blood shed during battles following the publication of the war time poem in Flanders Field. The poem was written by Lieutenant Colonel John McCray, MD, while serving on the front lines. I would like to read this poem as the memorial wreath is placed by the American Legion Post 208 in memory of those who gave their lives in service of our country. The wreath represents all branches of the United States military unified as one team to fight. To fight. Now the memorial wreath is presented and placed by American Legion Post 208 member Michael Jeanette. Je I don't know how, how you pronounce that last name. Genomo? Genomo? Where is it? Gianni. What? Say it. Gianni. Gianni. Michael Gianni. Thank you. In Flanders fields, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely sing and fly scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in Flanders field take up our quarrel with the foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith, faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Each year the American Legion Ladies Auxiliary distributes poppies uh, with the request of a donation made to support the future of veterans, active duty military personnel, and their families with medical and financial needs. Please consider wearing a red poppy today. Remember the fallen and support the living who have worn our nation's uniform. At this time, we invite Edna Drakeford to come up for a presentation of the Quilts of Valor. Good morning, everyone. I am a Baptist, and I don't like to sit in church very long either. <laughs> I'm here again today, as we did back in November for Veterans Day, to honor some of our veterans. Um, there's probably more here than we have quilts to give to, but I chose a few that are pretty prominent around here in Waxhaw. So my ladies and my, my ladies and my cohorts with me will be presenting. We have six to give away today, and uh, we do have some names, more names that we will be giving away uh, at Veterans Day. If we're, you're not on our list, please come and sign up for it so we can give you one. My first recipient today would be Bill Maloney. This is, this is what Bill's quilt looked like. meets uh, 
Uh, we have about eight ladies that we meet every Tuesday night, except when I'm on vacation. We actually sew from about 5.30 in the afternoon to about 8.30 at night. We meet, I have classroom space that we meet at over in Creative in Carolina. So some of you ladies respond on Facebook that Jim puts on there and says, great talent. There's talent out there too. If not, I'll show you how to use the sewing machine. And we can use the help. Uh, we're getting donations that's buying fabric uh, to help us make these quilts. It does take a little time. So we're trying to do them as fast as we can. So November is coming up pretty fast. So our next recipient, Is Charles Seinfeld here today? Okay. If not, Mr. Seinfeld. Um, John Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes is not here either. Okay. Richard Helms. tell some of you people about it, but he was very uh, generous in giving his other quilt to a person that was in hospice, and he was a veteran. So we decided just to help another quilt. <laughs> Our next recipient is Sandra Michelle. Is she here? Okay, we have to pick somebody else. Kim, you got another name?
today is Craig Horn. take to do one quilt, about how long? I can never put a time limit on it because I never work on more than one and the same one all the time. I'm working on four or five projects right here. <laughs> so, no, I just don't know how long it would take. Yeah, it takes weeks. Two weeks, then I have to pull up the weeks. Yeah. Okay. It takes weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's give uh, Miss Edna and these ladies a yeah. That's pretty awesome. You know, I knew Edna was awesome before she ever did this. And this, see, I used to be her mail carrier. <laughs> uh, a rural mail carrier. And I knew her house was one of those places that if I had trouble, it'd be okay to stop, you know, to get help. I just, I just knew. And one day, it was July, and it, she, she ain't, she's not going to remember this, but I'll never forget it. Uh, one July, it was like 90 plus degrees, the, the uh, humidity was unbelievable. I ran out of water and I was getting badly dehydrated. Dehydrated. I knew Edna's house was not too far up the road, so I got there and I pulled in her driveway and I got a nail and took it to her door and I said, can I please have a glass of water? She brought me the coldest, most awesome glass of water that I think I've ever had, and I gobbled it down, and I was able to make the rest of the wrap. But that's the kind of person she is. She's awesome, and I love her. <laughs> Second time my stuff's tried to escape. Um, thank you for all the, that have assisted in putting together today's ceremony. Special thanks are, uh, thanks are extended to the American Legion Post, uh, to a color guard and ladies auxiliary, you know, for their years, years of participation in our, in our patriotic ceremonies. Thank you, Parkwood Jr. ROTC, you did a beautiful job, and Rachel Sawhook, I mean, you know, your voice is just more beautiful every time I hear you, you're awesome. Cub Scouts, I, uh, Pack 53, and they're cute, but yeah, they're good too. You did a great job. And Pastor Chris, we appreciate you and the American Legion Post 208 for assisting us. And James and uh, Miguel with interface, auto, and visual for making it so you could hear me today, okay? And uh, they, you've done an awesome job. Appreciate it. And Miss Edna Drakeford and the Quilts of Valor for the lovely the beautiful quilts, that's just awesome what you have done. And we don't want to forget Scott Fard and the Vets Day Out Project. 
and a special thanks to the town of Waxhaw crew for their hard work in setting up today's event and I might add for taking it down when we all go home and we're propped up watching TV and the air conditioning they'll be here taking all this down and now last but not least thank you thank you for taking the time today you know there's a lot of other places you could have been today but you chose to come here and it's a lot cooler at home but thank you for taking the time to come today to this ceremony and we hope you'll join us for a light breakfast after we conclude the ceremony they call it a breakfast but this time of the day it might be brunch more like brunch uh is brought is brought to you by the stuffed olive you know down there next to food line they have prepared this it's, and just listen to this it's got egg bacon home fries fresh fruit bacon, uh, biscuits and drinks wow i believe that's worth hanging around for be sure to visit our special displays before you go home and again we're so glad you joined us in reflecting upon the fact that you know freedom truly is not free and i want to close with this one thing our our flag does not fly because the wind blows it it flies with the last breath of air i can't say this without crying i'm sorry <laughs> let me try again it always I always cry our flag does not fly because the wind blows it. It flies with the last breath of every soldier who died defending it. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. So we